So good morning, everyone. Hope you're enjoying DEF CON so far. Um, happy to see so many people in the early in the morning on the last day. So hope I won't get you asleep. Um, let's start with it. OK, so uh, a bit of introduction. I'm the head of the National Polish CSERT, so that's Computer Security Incident Response Team. Um, that's my job, but this research is not related to the job in any way. So just a disclaimer, that's my research, and uh, not necessarily all opinions are shared by my employer. Um, my background is a programmer, but that was a long time ago. I eventually got a degree in social psychology. That's not social engineering, that's related, but I don't think they get degrees in, give degrees in social engineering yet. And uh, I have 15 years of experience in IT security. And I also love everything about you know, flying and aviation. I almost became air traffic controller trainee at some moment. And I love to learn how system works, how systems works, you know, how the, everything uh, is going on in the background. So also because I uh, tend to fly a lot, both privately and uh, because of my employer, I enjoy some benefits uh, for frequent flyers. And I have some kind of disregard for frequent flyer miles. They don't have any real value to me anymore, but I still enjoy the privileges, like uh, lounge access or fast track access. They really save you time and give you some comfort at the airports except when somebody tries to fix the problem, when the problem doesn't really exist. So about a year ago, my home airport in Warsaw introduced this automatic self-service gates, which were supposed to speed things up. Because instead of you know, waving your boarding pass in front of a person, have them scanning it, you just uh, use a scanner and the gates let you in. Um, the only problem was with the fast track, it didn't read my status properly. So it would let in all the business class passengers, but I tend to travel on economy, and I only get the fast track access because I have this gold status. So it wouldn't read the status properly. So I would have to go to the guy anyway, show him my boarding pass, make him come to the gate, scan my boarding pass like two or three times. Like, you know, it's kind of counterproductive. Like it, you know, it's wastes about 30 seconds of my precious time and the guy probably has better things to do. So like, let's see if I can fix things. Um, so let's rewind a little bit. What are we talking about? As you probably noticed for the past 10 years or so, um, you get this little barcode on your boarding pass. Whether it's mobile, it's on paper, you still get a nice 2D body, uh, nice 2D uh, barcode on your boarding pass. And that was introduced in 2005 by IATA, which is International Air Traffic Association, if I get it properly, resolution, number 792. Uh, it introduces something called board, uh, barcoded boarding pass standard, which is adapted by all airlines, airports, everybody who deals with boarding passes, they have to obey to that standard. And um, so you get four different kinds of um, barcodes which can be used. When you have a paper boarding pass, it, will, it must always be PDF 417, which is the nice rectangle one, the white one. If it's on mobile, it should be one of the square ones. So it's QR code, which you probably know about, and the Aztec and data matrix, which you have examples of uh, down here. So. No, I got on, uh, on Google Play, started looking for barcode scanners to make my life easier, and fairly enough, you get like dozens of them. So the, the two in the middle, barcode scanner and, uh, by Geekslab and uh, Manatee would become my two favorites, but you get a wide choice. So with freely available tools, you can see what's inside. And this is pretty much what the boarding pass, uh, boarding pass looks like when it's uh, encoded in BCBP. So it's just a bunch of characters. 
And sort of by trial and error, I started figuring out, like, OK, if it doesn't read the, uh, my, my frequent flyer status properly, so probably I need to adjust the booking class, right? I need to say I'm in, I'm in business, and if that's what it reads, then let's see if it will let me in. So the other tool I would need would be a boarding pass generator, and fairly enough, there's also a bunch of them on uh, Google Play Store and I'm pretty sure on Apple Store as well. So like I said, first by trial and error, I figured out like this would be the travel class character. If you fly a little bit, you kind of get used to these letters like M would be for economy or Y would be for, for economy, C would be for business, things like that. Things like that. Um, and you also can pretty clearly see some things standing out like first name, last name, um, origin airport, departure airport, um, sorry, departure airport, destination airport, flight number. So some things you can make up just by looking at the, uh, at the clear text characters. So let's see if I switch this little character to C. And uh, mysteriously, it, it worked. It would let me in. So, fine, I saved, you know, 30 seconds about, uh, of my time every time I traveled through the fast track. So it's free fast track for all travelers. Neat, but, you know, what else can we get? You know, if, if this is not verified, what else is not verified? What else can I play with? And, you know, I started changing different things, like, you know, first name, last name. Yeah, fairly enough, lets you in. So, then I have like, Okay, so if there's one thing that can be verified easily, it's the booking code, right? Because that can be looked up in the reservation system. And maybe that could be matched to your boarding pass and, well, they could at least know whether you're traveling or not, whether the reservation is there or not, or you're somebody, you know, just making up things. So let's go ahead and change this. And it would also let me in. So now I got getting really confused. So what we are getting here is now airport access for all, pretty much, right? And just a bit of explanation. That was in Warsaw. I tested it in a number of different airports. In the US, it will work a bit differently, which I will come back to in a minute. But this works in a lot of airports. It's not, it's not something specific to Warsaw or you know, just one or two airports. And we will come back to why that is. So it's not just fast track access, it's, you know, airport access for all. And, yeah, I felt like, you know, there's like millions of travelers per day, like, how come nobody noticed it? That somebody had to spill this out already. And, yeah, this is not entirely news. So back in 2003, Bruce Schneier already noticed when, uh, when the concept of print your own boarding pass was introduced even before the barcoded boarding pass was there. That you can spoof a boarding pass, and uh, with this, you could also circumvent the no-fly list checks in the US. That was 2003. Until 2007, this was not fixed in any way. And uh, November 2006, uh, Chris Sokoyan, um, put up a web page where anybody could produce a fake, I think it was Southwest boarding pass, and he got into a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> so he got F pretty much FBA raided his home, and you know, he got, a, um, he got a nice letter from TSA saying like, you are violating these and these laws, don't do it, please. Um, there's also, um, two articles from 2008 and 2011, which were done jointly with Bruce Schneier. Um, they also touch a bit on physical security. I totally recommend going and reading them. It's very entertaining. And in 2012, uh, a John Butler also wrote an article on how you could possibly um, uh, figure out whether you are um, pre-check eligible or actually make yourself pre-check eligible. Uh, most, of, most of the technical stuff he got wrong in the article, but anyway, the idea was kind of cool. And he, you know, 
uh, made some things right at least. So how did the no-fly list bypass work back in 2003? So you would have to buy tickets under a false name because when you are buying the tickets, your name gets you know, matched against the no-fly list. Um, then you print your boarding pass at home. So this is one point where things get checked. So your name against the no-fly list. Then you create a copy of the boarding pass and uh, put your real name on it, which is on the no-fly list, but we'll come to that. Then you present the fake boarding pass to the TSA officer along with your ID. And the problem here is that TSA officers did not have access to the reservation system, so they only validated the boarding pass against your ID. So, you know, it's a fake boarding pass, but the name matches with your ID, you're good to go. And then when you actually board the plane, you discard the fake boarding pass, you produce your original boarding pass again, which matches the reservation system. And you can fly. So that was in 2003. And like I said, it was the same thing described in 2006 and 2007. Um, it got a bit improved since then, and we'll come to that. So this is the letter. I don't know if you can see it, but it's... Uh, it's easy to Google it up. It's, it's the letter that Mr. Sokoyan got for revealing this uh, letter and making up this uh, uh, fake boarding pass creator. So how does bypassing no-fly list work in 2016 Europe? So basically buy tickets under a false name, then you go to the airport and fly. <laughs> so not exactly an improvement. Um, why is that? First of all, um, yeah, just, just like two impacting factors. One is uh, that some airlines are more business conscious than the other. So they actually uh, will check your ID when you are boarding. But again, this is not airport thing, it's the airline thing. And why the airlines do it is because of protecting their business. So you just don't uh, buy cheap tickets and then resell them to somebody else. It's only for that reason. And it's mostly low-cost airlines which will check your IDs. The regular airlines almost never check your IDs in Europe. And uh, ID checks by the, at the security uh, checkpoints have been abandoned like two or three years ago when you are traveling domestically, but not only domestically, because of Schengen area, which I don't know how many of you are, know what it is, but it's like 26 countries in Europe it's not the same as European Union. It's 26 countries in Europe which agreed to like, abandon border checks. So you only have increased boarding, uh, border checks around the Schengen area and a lot of information exchange between the countries on, uh, on immigration. But there's no checks uh, within the area. So you can freely roam. You know, you don't need to follow the border checkpoints. You can just hike in the mountains or whatever. And when traveling within the Schengen zone, and it was officially asked to the you know, governments, etc., why there's no ID controls at the airport. It's like, there's no reason to do it. Like security is uh, provided by physical security screening. Fair enough. Um, okay, so let's go back a bit. Turns out I didn't need to be reverse engineering this boarding pass. Uh, format. It's, you know, it's all public. This IATA resolution is all public. You can just go and download it. And uh, this is the part which is mandatory for the boarding pass. So it's 60 characters. And uh, you get things like first name, last name. Uh, you get the compartment code, which is the, uh, the, the travel class. Can anybody spot a problem here? This is all that is mandatory. Nothing else is mandatory. So I'm going to help you here. There's absolutely no integrity checks and no authentication provided. It's just a 60 characters, and they're as good as you provide them. And um, just to be fair, this is the full specification, and there's a bunch of optional items. 
And one of them in the bottom is the security part, where you can provide something called a, they call a certificate, which is basically a digital signature for the boarding pass. So it can be included, but it's optional. And uh, we will come back to that. So the other way to verify it, like I said, would be to look up the booking number in the reservation system. So let's see, where is this passenger data stored? Where could it be looked up? Um, so basically, it's stored in something called computer reservation systems, which um, store your data in the format of passenger name records, which include lots of data, including lots of private, uh, private data, which is not only your uh, first name and last name, address, email address, but also things like special requests, which means whether you need special assistance, like a wheelchair or something, whether you have special dietary requirements, um, which could tell you like, whether you're Muslim or Jewish or things like that, and uh, loyalty programs data, etc. And uh, also, if you provided contacts for your precious ones in case of emergency, it would also end up there. Um, so this is one of the problems. There's a lot of private information which is not you know, allowed to be shared between different parties. The other problem is there's a lot of computer reservation systems out there. It's not like there's a single reservation system for all. So it's not to just go and look up the data by the PNR um, code, and you will pull out whatever you need. You need to know where to look for it. And there are a number of global distribution systems, which are like huge CRSs used by multiple airlines. Most famous ones are like Sabre and Amadeus and Galileo and Worldspan. But there's also a lot of proprietary ones, which are used by small airlines. They don't pay the fees to uh, big systems. They just run their own. And as long as it works for them, it's fine. You know, basically, the only place where you need to look up this information is where you check when you buy your tickets, when you check in, and when you're boarding the plane. So normally, airports don't have access to this data. Also, to make things more confusing and complicated, when you make a single reservation, it may end up with bits of information scattered around different reservation systems. So when I made, uh, when I made the res reservation for my flight here, I had a couple of flights code shared with Polish airlines. You know, the, the reservation was with United, which is using a different reservation system than a lot of Polish airlines. So at least two reservation systems would be involved. And if I was making that reservation through a travel agency, which is using a third reservation system, that would be at least three PNRs in three reservation systems. And you know, that's kind of confusing. And data access is not only limited across you know, different reservation systems, but not everybody, like I said, because of privacy reasons, has access to, um, to the same pieces of information in the, in the system. And yeah, notice of a device. Uh, the barcode uh, <coughs> uh, will usually have more information that is just in clear print. And if you use that information, um, you can access the reservation, you can access a lot of this private data online, and you can even make some changes like canceling tickets or modifying your itinerary. So just don't post anything uh, without making sure it's anonymized or blurred or something. And yeah, this is one of the examples, which is kind of ridiculous because, like I said, everybody can go. If you know which, uh, which CSR system is used by the airline, everybody can go to the website. If you have this PNR loc locator, which is also known as booking code or reference re um, reservation number, you put it in, and then you put the passenger's name in, and you get most of this data. At least you can see whether the reservation is there or not. But airports are not allowed to do so. And uh, from the reservation system, the data is then moved into a couple of other systems. One of them would be departure control system, which is basically the system which is used after you check in uh, to make sure that only the checked in passengers get on board. It also stores your seat assignments, um, baggage information, etc. cetera. Uh, there's also a thing called API advanced passenger uh, information not advanced, advanced passenger information, which is sent to uh, border agencies of several dozens of countries which require that. 
So it will let them know who is coming to their country and they can do some pre-screening and tell the airlines like this guy needs some additional security before he boards the plane. Um, there's also PNR.gov, which is not exactly another system, it's just a message exchange format um, to exchange PNR information, so the passenger record information with the government agencies. It's not widely used uh, though, apart from sending uh, advanced passenger information, which again has nothing to do with um, looking at the information at the airports, it's just for the border agencies. And there is a secure flight program, which I will describe more in detail in a moment. So okay, um, to, make, to make things easier for me, I put up a simple web page and I hope I will be yeah, able to show it. You know, it's, it's all JavaScript, so it works offline. And uh, I found a nice JavaScript libraries uh, for producing Aztec codes. So, PNR doesn't matter as I show you. Um, whatever. Um. And there you go. And um, wait, wait, wait. <clears throat> and I forgot to tell you, the, the only thing that actually needs to work is the flight number and the date. So the flight number actually gets matched against the list of flights that depart from the airport. Yeah, also the de departure airport needs to match the, the departure airport configured with the gate. And the date needs to match. It can be also the next day because, you know, sometimes you enter the airport and your flight is early in the morning. So it can be either of the two. Uh, okay, with paper it's just a bit less fun. So like I said, these automatic gates help things enormously because you don't even have to deal with humans, right? You don't have to produce anything which is even remotely, legitimately looking. It's just a barcode. But when you need a paper, it's no big deal. You just need to have this paper. So uh, you need to uh, edit the PDF probably. And I already have you know, a couple of templates for, for the airlines I use. And uh, by the way, Microsoft Word is a great PDF editing tool. Really, you can, you can just open the PDF and it will you know, convert it to a Word document and you can do all the editing you need. And just remember that anyway, Although people look at, tend to look at the paper, they will have to scan the, boarding, uh, the barcode anyway, so it should match the information that you have on the paper. So now let's get some fun, actually. You know, just getting to the airport is not much. So um, how about accessing lounges? So with contract lounges, there's basically, it's, it's almost too easy, right? Because they have no way to access this private information, so they have no way to look up the passenger records. So, you know, they will gladly buy whatever you present. Just a bit of advice, it needs to be based on the travel class. Because if you present the uh, gold card, you will be asked for the physical uh, gold card. Also, your data will, will be written down. And actually, uh, even if you have the the card, but it's, for example, the status expired or something, they actually have a way to look it up online. Um, so there, there is apparently a system when you can look up the, uh, the status card status and if it's valid and so on. So a bit trickier it should be with, with the airline operated lounges, right? Because they, <coughs> they are the airlines, they have access to passenger data, so they should be able to verify the status. And uh, there is at least one airline which attempts to do it. It's Scandinavian Airlines. They also have these lounges which are, they, they will let you in with automatic gates. So I thought like, this is easy and I travel through Copenhagen very often. So it gives you a lot of opportunities for trial and error. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, they actually do and at least seem to do uh, the checks on the reservation system. So whenever I tried to fiddle with like booking class um, it would 
uh, or my uh, status, it would just bounce me with a, it would always bounce with the same message like depart, departure airport is uh, not, not right or something like that. So, you know, a bit vague, <clears throat> but, you know, after it did so five times, I figured, like, it must, have, it must be just one message for, you know, all kinds of errors. So, anyway, they do some checking. Except, you know, there's, another, there's a lot of other allies, which, uh, the passengers of which are also eligible to use the lounge. Like, SAS is in Star Alliance. And there's about you know, 15 or 20 other allies which are on Star Alliance. And when you are traveling on another carrier with, within the same alliance, and you are traveling on business, you can still get into the lounge. And guess what? Not all airlines use the same reservation system. So all you need is to find a flight which is departing you know, in a reasonable time frame, operated by another carrier, hopefully that one that uses another reservation system. But it shouldn't be necessary and produce a, a fake boarding pass for that carrier. And guess what, it worked. Right, so I just used uh, Brussels Airlines, which uses totally different reservation system, and I put up information in a boarding pass from that, uh, for that flight, and it let me in. Also, there's uh, some airlines which don't do it properly. Specifically this one. It's, uh, it's the best airline in the world, according to many people. Uh, one in Istanbul, and it's operated by Turkish Airlines. And I thought, like, this is going to be hard, because it's really 99% flights are operated by Turkish uh, from that airport on Star Alliance. So there are very few flights which are Star Alliance, but not Turkish. So what am I going to do? Well, let's first try if they will let me in with, you know, just a random Turkish flight data. So... I just looked up, you know, on the departure uh, board, I looked up a random flight from Istanbul to London Gatwick. I like to use the name of Bartholomew Simpson. <laughs> he was a good pranker, prankster. Yeah, the date needs to match. And I need to warn you, I, I had the camera hidden in plain sight, so <laughs> it was dangling from my shoulder back. So this is the automatic gates. No need to talk to the dragon lady. <laughs> and by the way, this is a full-sized cinema inside the lounge. Yeah. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> You don't need to be traveling, like I said. You can do the same to enter the airport. You will still go through security screening, so they will take all your liquids, but no need to worry here. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, after Wired um, did an article on this, and they actually published this video. I got, you know, lots of requests, by the way. This one is from Israeli lawyer. Like... <laughs> What's wrong with Israeli lawyers? Really, are they paid so bad that they can't afford lounge access? <laughs> <clears throat> One other nice thing is uh, you have duty-free shops at the airports, right? And again, you don't need to be traveling. And in many countries, it's not like in the US, so you don't get your sealed back in the passenger seat. You just get it to go. And uh, the eligibility for uh, tax-free prices is, depend uh, is, is uh, determined on whether you are traveling inside the EU or outside the EU. So if it's inside EU, it's uh, domestic prices, so uh, including tax. And if you're traveling outside EU, uh, you get this tax-free price. And uh, here's the difference. <clears throat> so 
to convert it to you. It's one liter. I have no idea what it is in US, but it's uh, about 25 shots. And 20... <laughs> and then... Uh, 25 Zlotis is about $7. So I think it's a good deal. So what do we get? It's uh, yeah, airport access, so we can meet and greet your loved ones, do some sightseeing, fast track, free lunch and booze, duty free shopping. Okay, let's, let's get to some serious stuff. Uh, like, how can it be prevented? And uh, what is actually done to prevent it? So IATA has a nice section in, a, I think it's 80 pages or so document. They have this half a page section on fraud prevention, uh, which nicely identifies the risks associated with boarding by a BCBP. Right? So it can be modified, it can be forged, it can be duplicated. And uh, pretty much all the mitigation they came up with is check that the passenger is on the passenger name list and uh, add a certificate. And like I said, by certificate, they really mean the digital signature. So let's see how the digital signature is doing. So it was introduced in 2009 by uh, version three of the standard. And it's based on PKI. And uh, one thing about PKI is it needs to be deployed properly, right? So you need to distribute the, uh, the public keys. So it would have to be there you know, at every checkpoint uh, you would have to maintain the CRLs, etc., etc. And also, many airlines would still use version one, which does not support uh, digital signatures. So all the readers also need to support uh, these old versions. And again, this field is optional, and this is quotation from the document: op optional and to be used only when required by the local security uh, administration. So it's not even encouraged. Like it's. It's only to be used when it's uh, required. Uh, the specific algorithm is determined by the authority. And uh, this was enforced by TSA to US carriers, but not entirely. For example, when I was traveling here, uh, I had my boarding card produced in Amsterdam, and it was printed neatly on United paper, but it had no digital signature. I will come to that. Um, there's another thing which could be used, which is a standard called BCBP XML. This is for transporting data between checkpoints and the airline systems. So uh, it's just the, again, it's, it's just the data format, um, which is standardized by IATA. And it could be used to check the PNR data against the reservation systems with no private, uh, private information getting transferred. So you just, uh, you just send the, whatever you scanned from PNR, and the airline would cut up, come up with the uh, zero or one. So good to go or not good to go, possibly with an explanation if it's not good to go uh, with the reason. The problem again is the complexity. Um, many airports are serving like more than 200 airlines, and they would have to connect to each of their reservation systems, right? And if they don't connect to 10 out of 200, you still have a way to produce a fake boarding pass, pretty much. If you don't cover 100%, you still get a loophole, right? So just the complexity of the solution um, probably is the reason why it doesn't really work, and I haven't seen it deployed anywhere. And there's also one thing that TSA seems to be doing right, at least starting from uh, 2013. So Secure Flight is a program that they've uh, implemented in, in 2009. Um, and the reason for, for the program was to take over the um, monitoring of watch lists, so the no-fly lists and the uh, secondary screening lists from the airlines to the TSA authorities. So instead of relying on airlines, they said, like, no, 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 we need this information, and uh, we will do the verification. Like, um, also, part of the secure flight is the TSA pre-check program uh, introduced in 2011. So you get this um, nice BCBP uh, field specifically for this reason, 
which is called Select the Indicator, which tells you whether you are uh, like uh, selected for the secondary screening or whether you're eligible for pre-check or whether you're just traveling as usual. And uh, in 2013, TSA started networking their devices, the scanning devices, to pull passenger data um, from this secure flight. And it includes passenger's full name, gender, date of birth, screening status, uh, reservation number, flight itinerary. So it can be verified if it's deployed at all the airports. I'm not sure about that. It can be verified at the uh, screening checkpoint. And if it doesn't match exactly, you know, they have like a nice list of suggestions, like this, this uh, passenger's name is close enough. You know, maybe this, it's, it's one of these. Um, so technically, they have a way to do it now. Again, whether it's deployed properly and uh, how many airports support it, I'm not sure. It just started in 2013. And generally, it's a, it's a correct way to do it, probably. And okay, why is DEFCON awesome? I thought I had my presentation, you know, all fixed and done. And then on, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, I get contacted by um, uh, Kyle Kosher saying like, hey, I saw your talk on the agenda and then um, here's something that I got from eBay and maybe you want to play with that. And that something was... Uh, uh, this beauty. <laughs> So it's a, it's a device that you're normally not allowed to buy, <coughs> I think. <laughs> um, so this information is from the public website, so you get you know, this level of specification, uh, but it would only be sold to like a limited number of parties. And this, uh, this offer is no longer on eBay, unfortunately. It was, I think, $160, so not a big deal. So I had like two days to play with that, and I exchanged a couple of messages with Carl, and um, here's how it works. So we see the booting. Yeah, you see airport is dash, dash, dash. Yeah, because departure airport is not configured. So it's, you know, we have some constraints. So let's try scanning any random boarding pass. So you know, when you go with the, any random old boarding pass, likely the departure airport is not dash, dash, dash. It's something else. And the date is probably not the same as on the boarding pass, uh, on the scanner, sorry. But it will have a valid signature. Let's see what it does. So it says, Invalid departure location, refer to counter. So it did not complain about the signature, but it did complain about the departure airport. So, okay, so let's fix the departure airport. Ah, damn it. Sorry again. <clears throat> this time with audio. Three beeps, not good to go, red light. But all it says is invalid departure location. So now you see me using my mobile phone. I, you know. Okay. So now the departure location was okay, date was okay, but the signature is invalid. And it says refer to superior. Wow. So So I don't know if you noticed, but it actually said that the, yeah, that the SIG is not there. So it should go through some manual checking. 
The problem I see here is it still gives you a green light and uh, you know one beep. So depending, you know, how uh, vigilant, uh, you know, uh, the, the TSA agent is and how much noise to radio he has, he has, you know, a good chance missing this. So yeah, let's try modifying the select indicator. So three beeps, green light, and you'll see the LLL. So we are eligible for pre-check. Or if you fancy, you can actually <laughs> go for secondary screen. Yeah, SSS. OK. So uh, airport access is confirmed, fast track is confirmed, free lunches, booze is confirmed, duty free shopping is confirmed. Pre-check, I'm not sure, right? But, you know, nice idea to play with if you have balls. <laughs> uh, so now about responsible disclosure. I actually went out and uh, I tried to talk about this problem to several authorities and airports and uh, airlines because it's their problem eventually. And this is uh, what, I, what came back. So first I contacted a lot of Polish airlines. They say like, no, it's, we just issue boarding passes and it's the airport that verifies it. So I went to uh, the airports and in these two cases I was lucky because I actually had you know, known people on the management board, at the management board level. So I was able to talk to them in person. And, like, and the airport authority said like, yeah, it's a known issue but it's not really a problem. We're, you know, you're following any, uh, all, all the guidelines and uh, laws, that's fine. Then the Civil Aviation Authority, like they, it took them three or four months to reply. They said, all, all they had to say was like, boarding pass forgery is a crime, don't do it. So like, okay, according to my lawyer, well, not exactly my lawyer, but the lawyer I know, <coughs> is uh, if, you, if you want to have a legitimate uh, document, you need to, have a way to verify it. It's not a document if you cannot verify it, if it doesn't bear any you know, signature at all. And they like, oh, it's, it's not the exact wording they use, but it was pretty much the message, right? <laughs> and um, this is also what, what I got from Turkish Airlines and SAS. So I, you know, I... <laughs> uh, yeah, no comment here. And the question you might have is like, would it actually get me flying? And I, the short answer would be no. Like that there would be very rare circumstances when you would be able to get on the plane, but you would be likely spotted before it even departs and it would get you into a lot of trouble. So I don't recommend doing that. But you can ha still have a nice souvenir. And that's a kind of a bonus. So one of the airports in Europe, and I will not name them because they actually had a, you know, they communicated very openly with me and they said like why, why it is. They confirmed it's because of privacy. Uh, they decided to have like loyalty program for the passenger, which makes sense because the airport collects fees on every departing passenger, so they want to encourage traffic. So they have this, you know, uh, list of gadgets that you can get for a certain number of points and the points you get for every departing flight and to register a departing flight, you need to scan your loyalty card and your boarding pass. <laughs> like, what can go wrong, right? <laughs> so, here's a simple equation. <laughs> so, I, I, I really liked the blanket in the middle. It would cost me 600 points, which is six flights. And you see five QR codes because I had, you know, one uh, legit flight. I said, you know, it was, and the funny thing is that it was, you know, I, I even made it look le sort of legit because I produced uh, the QR codes for the flights like over the next, over the next two days. And uh, it could really fit into a story like I was flying to Edinburgh and then going back in three hours and yeah, I could make it. <laughs> so to wrap it up, um, it's the privacy and complexity of, of the system which is preventing this exchange of data. And, uh, you know, most important point, while US did a reasonably good job preventing that, 
um, other places actually lowered the bar for us, especially with introducing the, um, uh, the automatic gates. So here are the sources, and uh, don't worry, um, because uh, this is the link for the slides, and most of that will uh, also be on the conference DVD. So thank you. I don't think we have time for questions, but I hope you liked it. Thank you.